as of late, a word on everybody's hot list is snitch and snitching. Regular people now talk about paperwork parties for some reason, and while regular people who idolize criminals think it's okay to rob, sell dope, lead gangs, run mafia families, and take lives for money or sport, uh, these same regular people get internet upset when these people become informants, witnesses, and snitches. Kind of ironic. But that being said, I've made a list of a few of the most iconic snitches in terms of their criminal power or their pop cultural relevancy uh, of recent times. Uh, now, with there being so many snitches to choose from, your personal choices might not be on the list. But don't be mad at me. Al Prophet always tries to do his best. So, coming in, the top slot, the most interesting. Tim the Tool Man Taylor, a.k.a. Tim Allen. Michigan, 1978, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek Airport. Uh, those two cities are a few hours west of Detroit. They're best known home for being the home of Kellogg's cereal. But in October 78, Tim Allen almost got himself a mandatory sentence of life no parole under uh, the law that was in effect in Michigan then, the 650 Lifer Law, because he got caught with a kilo of cocaine uh, in the airport in 78. Now, he had already slightly started his comedy career, very slightly, and he was in college, and I, nobody, I can't find the records, but he, who specifically told on, but he turned that life no parole into, I think he did a year. At least he snitched and went on uh, to make something of his life. A lot of people snitch and just go back to doing the same things. But yeah, he gets caught with, with a thousand grams of cocaine in the airport. At the time, 650 would get you life no parole in Michigan, which hardly makes you a kingpin, but uh, it's good they repealed that law recently. He grew up in a place called Birmingham, Michigan. If there's any place that's privileged, it's that. Back in the 60s when he was growing up, it was one of the most elite suburbs in the whole United States, wealthier than Gross Point. Uh, I mean, wealthier than uh, Beverly Hills. Uh, Gross Point's another city in Michigan, weather, wealthier than Beverly Hills. Um, and, of course, he went on to be a stand-up comedian in the 80s, 80s and he landed uh, his show Home Improvement in 91, uh, played a suburban father set in Metro Detroit. So, like, he was, he, you know, he's somebody, this icon, not just uh, in pop culture in general. In Michigan, you know, Detroit doesn't get a lot of, a lot of shine, and uh, Tim Allen was one of the biggest stars of the 90s because that show was so big. So Tim Allen had it easy growing up, and they took it easy on him when he got in some trouble. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe mommy and daddy pulled some strings for him because I tell you, when my partner Bernstein published a story about this in the Oakland Press, it's a... It's where Birmingham is at. It's the suburban county of Detroit. Tim Allen, this is like maybe six years ago, Tim Allen's mother called Bernstein's boss. Take that story about my son out of the paper. His mother, and mind you, I mean, it's, you know, public record. His mom called the newspaper. So imagine what mommy and daddy might have done when he got in his legal trouble. I, you know, I don't know. Tim Allen went to Western Michigan in College in Kalamazoo. That's where he built up enough clientele to be uh, in, the, in the market for a brick in 1978, which that was a lot of cocaine for back then. And his childhood friends say that he, he built up the business not to support his own habit, but consciously so he would have uh, the money to allow him the time to try to be a professional comedian. So that's a story in a lot of entertainment. It didn't start with rap, with there being, uh, you know, uh, criminal elements. That's always been a part of the entertainment business. It's, it's why so many artists that you see get popular, they come from wealth. Because somebody got to buy you the equipment and you got to have the free time. If you're 21 working a full-time job or working the streets full-time, hard to become a rapper, comedian, or anything else. So Tim Allen built his career off selling dope. That's how he was able to springboard and get going as a comedian. And then almost 24 people were arrested because of Tim Allen across uh, 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 Michigan. And he left and went to Hollywood uh, after two years, a mere two years in prison. I don't know what happened to the other 24 
people. Quote, Tim Allen was very reluctant to spend the rest of his life in prison, so he decided to play ball. That was what an FBI agent said, recalling Tim Allen's work. The information he gave helped build several other cases after the entire ordeal, and to his credit, he obviously went on to turn his life around. All right, next, someone you were force-fed as a hero of the streets, Frank Lucas. Noted federal informant, social security benefits thief, and one-time heroin dealer for the New York mob. Lucas was a man so uneducated he couldn't count, so he weighed the proceeds of his street-level heroin business before turning the ticket money into the Italians he worked for. He once put a contract out on his own brother's life. Now, after many years of laying extremely low to avoid being killed by one of the many, 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 many New York drug dealers he testified against and set up for arrest, Frank Lucas got lucky when a 2002 article appeared in New York Magazine written by Mark Jacobson. It was called The Return of Superfly. And that started the wheels burning. Somebody in Hollywood saw the article and said, oh, this has all the components we can weave into a movie. So, uh, black man versus the mafia. Remember, that was in the trailer that he's, he, you know, he's going to go to the jungle and get his own and we don't need the guineas. And in the trailer for the movie, they, no black man has ever done that. Well, <laughs> Frank Lucas stole that story from a, 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 a black guy, Leslie Ike Atkinson. Leslie Ike Atkinson was a uh, U.S. military logistics uh, sergeant or something, but when he retired, when he was about 50 years old, that was when Vietnam was about to kick off, late 60s, he was in gambling circuits with other mostly black uh, GIs around Germany and Thailand. He definitely, for uh, any black heroin dealer was number one in terms of sending it into the country and that's he was still finishing his 30 some year prison term I've, I've been to Ike Atkinson's apartment he was still prison is finishing his 30 some year prison term when Frank kind of co-opted that part of you know Frank Lucas created an amalgam character for himself to tell Mark Jacobson the journalist yeah, the, the, what would be interesting about Ike Atkinson, I went to Thailand. I didn't need the guineas. And, you know, he took the best aspects of Frank Matthews' character, Nicky Barnes, you know, and kind of Pee Wee Kirkland and kind of attributed them to himself and made himself seem like a superhero. I mean, even the famous iconic picture of him in the chinchilla coat the Jet Magazine that's from, I reuse a picture from that same spread a lot in my Detroit documentaries because there was a much larger photo of all a bunch of guys and their wives from Detroit all dressed like how he was dressed. It wasn't just one of them. They got more space than him. So he wasn't even, he was just a face in the crowd even at that fight. He didn't show up there and like, oh, who's this, the biggest drug dealer in America? So it was many criminals, uh, Italian, black, and otherwise, in attendance at that fight. So in 2012, I was screening my film, Frank Matthews in New York, and Mark Jacobson, the guy that wrote uh, that original article, was sitting next to me, and boy, he, he didn't speak fondly of Frank Lucas, and I was sitting with Ron Chepsik in Ike Atkinson's apartment in Durham when he got out of prison after doing like 37 years, like I said, he had retired successfully from the military, so even though he did all that prison time, he still was due his U.S. military pension because he didn't commit any crimes while he was active duty. So he uh, had, you know, had a little apartment that he could pay for with his pension, and Ike was a, the most normal seam. You would have never thought he did 38 years and that he had been involved in what he'd been involved in. I think he just, more than anything, was a gambler, and he like liked the excitement of sending loads. But anyways, we were sitting in there with Ike and the phone rings and he was like, oh, this is Richie. So the character, Richie Roberts is the white cop who worked with Frank Lucas and that's who Russell Crowe's character is based on. So Richie Roberts is a lawyer in real life. So he helped Ike and Frank a little bit with some legal stuff later in life. So they're I mean, they're friends in the sense they all, or they both are part of that movie that got them paid. But uh, anyways, it was Richie calling to tell Ike, like, oh, Frank's, Frank's in trouble again. Frank Lucas had been stealing his son's disability check, 
and cashing it and just spending the money. So he got like a, a fraud case and got put on probation. So Frank Lucas at that point had already, the American gangster had only been out four or five years. He'd already run through the 900000 and the house they bought him, and he was, he was stealing his, uh, his son's check. So Frank Lucas, of course, was portrayed by Denzel Washington. It's kind of a perfect example of what's wrong with getting your historical info from Hollywood movies. Because Denzel's a movie star. He's charismatic. He, you know, people like him. Frank Lucas was not like that in real life. Denzel's likable, handsome, and intelligent. Frank Lucas isn't really any of those things, or wasn't. And Frank did tell on a lot of people, but not a single cop. So remember, that was part of the marketing and why you're supposed to love Frank Lucas. That, you know, even when it got tight for him, he just told on crooked cops. They had to create that for the Hollywood movie so that he would be palatable. Because even regular people don't want to see someone send their own friends to prison. Well, that's what Frank Lucas did. He didn't rat on any uh, police. He sent a lot of his peers to prison, though. In fact, uh, he was so bad, <laughs> I found this one case where Frank Lucas helped the feds get a bunch of guys who really didn't know each other together into one indictment because he told the feds that they all were buying their cut from the same person, like their quinine or whatever, which isn't really a crime in itself, but it tied them to their own heroin conspiracies. And even though they didn't interact with each other because Frank put them all at the same pharmacist, it made one mega conspiracy. So... Frank was one of the most productive informants. He's like a black Sammy the Bull Gravano. He was a very productive informant. Uh, as Frank Atkinson, he served over 30 years in prison. Frank Lucas stole his story uh, while he was out, or while he was in. And when he got out, he did do a book in him, him and Ram Chepsik, Chepsik, which is very good, but too late for a movie deal because they had just made uh, American Gangsters. So Ike died without seeing his... Uh, story that was stolen come to the big screen. It is true that Frank Lucas was a giant heroin dealer in New Jersey and Harlem for a chunk of the 70s, but the fact is uh, he was always getting it from the Italians. He didn't snitch on any cops. So that's the truth of your American gangster. All right, now on to Whitey Bulger. Devil's Night 2018, that's the night before Halloween. Less than 12 hours after he showed up to a federal prison in West Virginia, notorious Boston gangster and snitch James Whitey Bulger was found beaten to death in his cell. In fact, his eyes were somewhat gouged out and part of his tongue was cut. But lest you think he was just a gangster who turned rat, Bulger's case is a little weirder and darker than that. After going to prison for truck hijacking when he was young, where he became a subject in the CIA's infamous LSD experiments on federal prisoners under the MK Ultra program. Yes, Whitey Bulger. He got out and he uh, went back to Boston, started working his way up the ranks of Irish organized crime. Bulger told anyone that would listen that he hated snitches. But when FBI agent John Connolly, who he grew up with, or knew from childhood, approached him in the fall of 1975, that all changed. Whitey and the Fed came up together in one of South Boston's uh, public housing projects, infamous for crime and racism. And when Agent Connolly, that was the FBI agent's name, was eight and Bulger was about 19, Bulger saved him from a bully who was trying to take his ice cream cone or something. And uh, so when Connolly got assigned back to Boston, he... I don't, it's unclear if they maintain connection all that time. But anyways, in 1975, uh, they make a deal. So prior to that, Whitey was running illegal gambling and loan sharking with the Winter Hill Gang of South Boston. He was just one of a myriad of Irish and Italians that checkered Boston with organized crime. A lot went on, but I'll summarize it with this. The Irish gangsters didn't want to bow down to the Italians who ran Boston for the Patriarcha family, who they controlled all of New England. And so Whitey Bulger and his right-hand man, Stephen the Rifleman Flemmy, made this deal in 75, and they gave so much info on the Italians 
that Connolly was able to go from being just a regular FBI field agent. He made so many cases against the Italian mob in Boston. He got rapidly promoted to being the head of the office. So Whitey was destroying his chief enemy, the Italians, and the Fed that was getting this bad info. Now, think about this. Anytime you see a case, when there's a big case in the news, the feds that work the case, like any job, they get promotions, they get, you know, it's good for their career. So when, you, when people will say, like, someone's kind of framed or rigged up in a case, and you think, well, what is, would be the motivation of, of law enforcement to do that? Could just be like at any job. You do a good job, you get a promotion, you make more money. So Bolger and his corrupt FBI agent got rid of the mob, the Italians together, and the FBI is running the Boston field office, and now Whitey can truly run amok. He has an iron grip on South Boston. People are killed for petty things. He also has a predilection for little girls, uh, several, like, 12, 13-year-old girlfriends, and then he ended up killing them. One of them's mother came snooping around. He put her in the ground. He killed a lot of women that, that had been their girlfriends, him and the riflemen. Real, real bad people with literally a license to kill from not the FBI main office, but the, the, the boss of the Boston division. In fact, there was one hit uh, where some FBI agents pretty much acted as lookouts to make sure the Boston Police Department didn't drive through when Whitey's crew was taking somebody out. And John Connolly, the FBI guy, in a way, he became an informant to Whitey. He would tell Whitey uh, what guys were planning on talking. A guy comes in an FBI with his lawyer and says, listen, I want to talk. And he goes and tells Whitey, and Whitey would execute him. So pretty bad. So in 1994, Agent Connolly gave Bolger warning that the feds were coming to arrest him. He got out of Dodge. Uh, and he eventually became public enemy number one once Osama bin Laden was killed. Whitey Bolger, you know, managed to stay on the run for 15 years. And for the last four or five years, he was public enemy number one. Um, Agent John Connolly got 40 years in prison. I'm sure he'll die in prison, but you could have gave him 400 years and it wouldn't have been too much. FBI agents who abuse their power like that is quite frightening. So Whitey was able to stay free 15 years in the way he was caught, because he was actually living right around in Santa Monica, California, blending in as just another upscale white retiree, is vanity. His girlfriend liked to get her teeth cleaned every month. Now, Dennis tell you if you get your teeth cleaned twice a year, you're doing good, maybe three times. But so that was an odd detail. And somebody that was friends with her was like, excuse me, well, gee, she fits the description and she gets her teeth cleaned once a month because they put that in the APB. And that's how they caught him. And he had money hidden in the wall and stuff. So still unrepentant, Whitey, after 15 years uh, on the run, he took him to trial. And a jury found him guilty of involvement in 11 murders, and he got hit with two life sentences. Now, Bolger acknowledged his involvement with racketeering, gambling, loan sharking, and drug dealing, but he wouldn't admit he was an informer. I was the guy that did the directing. They didn't direct me, he said in a CNN documentary. Now, in a way, right, Whitey was right. I mean, he corrupted an entire FBI field office and used them to help eliminate his competition and rivals to his power. So, I mean, I guess if you're the one controlling the police, you could tell yourself you're not snitching, but uh, the fellas in uh, Hazleton USP didn't uh, see it the same way as him. And like I said, within 12 hours of getting there, uh, he was in a wheelchair and these guys came into cells, multiple people beat him, gouged on him, his eyes gouged out, part of his tongue cut out. It was the third homicide in 40 days at Hazleton U.S. Penitentiary. So the way, you know, and they, Whitey might have still had secrets, the feds didn't want to come out. So if you want to have somebody killed without actually, you know, committing a murder conspiracy, you look at all, because you, you can send them to any prison. You're the Bureau of Prisons. You say, oh, Hazleton just had two murders in the last month. They over there rocking. Oh, and there's some mobsters in there. Stick the 88-year-old man in a wheelchair in there. 
and leave the cell door unlocked. So the guy, one, one inmate took all the weight. It was a guy who was already doing life, Freddie Gias, who was a Greek guy. Uh, he had killed a mafia capo out of, well, he had killed some mobsters in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the, like the capo of that little subfamily had ratted him out. So he probably, like Whitey, was reminding him of the guy who ratted him out. And this Freddie Gias, even though the physical evidence makes it look like more than one person attacked Bolger, he took all the weight. And, uh, but he's been in solitary confinement ever since then, and his family now is petitioning to get him out. So the mob did get a rat when they caught him uh, with, with Whitey Bolger. You know, it seems like there's a lot of personal animosity towards that guy. He's one rat who got his just desserts. Okay, and, and uh, last on the hit parade, ba -doom -doom, gallows humor, none other than Sammy the Bull, who is a big YouTube sensation right now. You guys love his channel because Sammy and uh, ratting uh, and, and all those, uh, among other things, the 19 murders he said he per did himself or helped orchestrate. In doing that, he can, uh, you know, go into detail and talk about these things. So here you have a mobster that can really tell stories and talks about going through the tr trial and, you know, but you guys claim to hate snitches so much, but you sure love Sammy the Bull. He is an awesome storyteller and he has great stories to tell, but one he doesn't tell is that from dealing with him, his son got nine years in prison when Sammy got that sweetheart deal. Five mere years, I just got played, played, said he did 19 murders to get John Gotti because Gotti's name was in the public eye. So the prosecutors wanted to get Gotti. Remember, these prosecutors who put Gotti away, they get book deals, they get interviewed. Uh, Sammy the Bull was just a mobster who people in the street knew who he was, but 19 people is a lot of people to kill. That makes you a serial killer. Sammy the Bull got five years. It was such a publicity hound, such a, a, an attention seeker, he immediately pops out of witness protection, does an interview with 60 Minutes. I'm in Phoenix and I own a restaurant. Uh, if they're gonna come for me, come for me. I'm sure he had friends, you know, down just like Alpo, just cause you ride on one set of people, maybe some other people that'll still ride or die with you. So. Uh, and then his, his son got mixed up in an ecstasy ring and Sammy, I didn't read the court things. I mean, it's presented as like Sammy just gave him some advice, but he probably, his criminal mind probably kicked in and they, he was orchestrating it and it was, it was grossing up to a million a week at one point and that came crashing down. So there, I, uh, I was uh, in Maricopa County Jail when Sammy was in there getting treated like a total celebrity. Like on the canteen, you know, you could get shampoo or conditioner. Well, he had anti-dandruff and this and styling mousse. Like the guy's cell was like a, 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 a hair shop. And uh, his son, I passed out towels to, uh, Salvatore. And he got nine years in prison. That's a long time for a first offense. I mean, it was a big ecstasy case, but, you know, Sammy shouldn't be really... He should be ashamed to show his face that case. And he got 18 years for that. They slammed him because he, he had just confessed to 19 murders, testified in front of Congress, put all these people away, got a mere five years. He doesn't have enough respect for, for anything. He doesn't even want to stay in witness protection. He wants attention. And then he gets in a big drug ring and they slammed him that time. And he did a lot of his time at Florence. You can watch his channel. I'm sure he tells stories about Florence. I mean, it seemed like Sammy, if nobody else, would be a guy at risk in prison for being an informant. I mean, but it's how you're perceived, I guess. Sammy's likable. Whitey Bulger wasn't really likable. I mean, because what Sammy did is, you know, in terms of ratting, was probably even was, was worse than Whitey. But... Whitey did a lot of unsavory things, period, that people just don't like with kids and murdering women and blah, blah, blah. And he just had a bad personality. Same with the Bull Gravano. Uh, kind of the, he made mafia snitching okay, I guess, because after him, there's been bosses of families that snitch. He was, 
the highest ranking person at that time, which was a coup for the feds because that also sent a signal to other heavy hitters like, well, you know, and Sammy, life of crime, 19 murders, five years. So the kind of people they make deals with. And then, of course, he, he hadn't seen the error of his ways because he right back, got right back out and got in an 18-year drug conspiracy. So that was just some of the more iconic and interesting snitches. Tim Allen to Sammy the Bull, our prophet American dope.